This presentation is actually, uh, it's not about the technology, rather like uh, we focused on the approach or the process uh, you need to actually adhere to transform, digital transform organization. So we will talk about, uh, so this is based on the success stories we had for last, uh, I think I'm, I've been working for WSL products uh, for almost now eight years. Uh, so based on the experience I had, uh, uh, I have come up with a process uh, which actually can transform organization uh, uh, smoothly uh, based on uh, WSL products. So the topic is achieving uh, predictable success in digital transformation with the WSL platform. So we'll, uh, let's uh, first start off with the digital transformation pillars. So uh, there are a lot of uh, variations, there are a lot, lot of flavors for these pillars, uh, like people have their own thoughts and people have their own opinions on these pillars. But uh, as, as you like uh, summarize this, uh, it's all about the people, process and tools. So if in order to do a proper digital transformation, you need to actually transform these three pillars, that is people, process and tools. So if you take uh, uh, people aspect, uh, so it could be internal or external users and it could be a third party API consumer as well. Like in nowadays, uh, we need to expose APIs to third party. So that's that's all about the digital transformation. And the process is the current methodology you uh, normally follow. So it could be uh, the waterfall method or maybe agile or maybe like any other process like lean or any Kanban or anything like that. And uh, we also talk about the governance structure as well. So in terms of tools, uh, so you need to have like uh, proper tools in place uh, in, for our digital transformation. So we like highly uh, want to have a central knowledge base, but as we talk to people in normal organizations, uh, they don't have proper knowledge base uh, implemented, rather like uh, all the information is in their heads. So it's very hard to like uh, summarize those information. So the, when, when it comes to tools, uh, there are other tools like uh, sales enablement tools uh, and other automation tools as well. So these are the pillars we have identified. Uh, so let's see like uh, how we can, uh, we'll take an example and we'll see how we can address uh, a digital transformation journey. So introducing Toro Bank. So Toro Bank, uh, it's actually, a, this is a demo application we have created inside Chakrai. So uh, Toro Bank, uh, so all the development is done uh, within Chakrai, so we can actually showcase a demo if you require. So Toro Bank is a bank uh, ecosystem, um, and uh, if you see uh, the Dave, Dave uh, the CIO of uh, Toro Bank is uh, very frustrated. The reason is like uh, due to these uh, three pillars, people, process, and tools. So the main problems are like, uh, there's no way to actually expose uh, APIs to third parties, so that is the main problem. And also like inconsistencies when creating uh, uh, users, customers in CRM and co-banking. So they have like two different systems. Uh, the one is the, first one is the CRM system and they have another co-banking system. So those, those are isolated. So what you have to do is when you need to onboard a customer, you have to create the customer in a CRM and also you need to create the custom in core banking. So sometimes like it's error prone, like you might miss information in uh, there and it sometimes it make it uh, inconsistent. And in terms of the process, uh, they are actually following waterfall methodology and there's no proper governance structure uh, in place. So each person work in, uh, in isolation, so in work in their silos. And in terms of the risks, uh, so those are not identified initially. So uh, in that case, like it uh, results to missing deadlines. Uh, so the tools is, uh, in terms of tools, uh, so they don't have a knowledge, uh, central knowledge page base. And also the project plan is done in Excel sheets. And a lot of manual in interventions happening. Uh, so uh, there's no like automated uh, tools available. And also they are using uh, legacy technologies for CRM and co-banking systems like uh, tools like COBA and also like sometimes even uh, SOAP uh, can be a legacy these days because we are talking about uh, REST. So this is the existing co-banking uh, system available in Toro Bank. So it has, uh, so it, it has all the information uh, which uh, need for a bank. So. You have accounts, you have customers, and you have all the banking uh, details here. You, even like transactions are also there for interbank communication. So we'll take this as an example. So now, now the problem uh, comes uh, when you have this application. So this is the loan application. So this is actually a third-party application. 
this is actually a mobile wallet. Uh, so what it does is you can actually add your own bank to this and uh, once you link it and once you give the consent, all the accounts will be listed uh, in this uh, loan application. So it has the summarization of the accounts and you see the transactions there and also like the, it has a QR code based payments ecosystem. So where you can do the mobile payment. So these days like uh, normally you see these type of applications uh, here. So we, uh, like initially we have loaded uh, four cards uh, uh, by using a few other banks here. So these are the existing cards. So let's see like how we can enable a Toro Bank to add uh, uh, to the loan application. So the this uh, the problem one comes with uh, that uh, loan integration. So obviously, uh, so what you have to do is uh, for this loan application uh, from the co-banking system. So as I mentioned you earlier, uh, co-banking has uh, these uh, co-banking backends, access to servers, and ISO 8583 server components there. So it's uh, sometimes uh, like these technologies are, are legacy now. So you have to expose accounts, balances, and transactions. So if you carefully observe this, this is uh, one of the concepts in open banking, uh, that is the AISP flow, right? So you need to expose these AI, uh, accounts, balances, and transactions in order to enable uh, the loan application. And for the second problem, we are introducing Vogue. So Vogue is a shopping cart. So shopping cart, uh, this Vogue application, uh, uh, you have, uh, you can actually list all the shopping cart related uh, items here. And uh, then once you check out, it will prompt a QR code. So that QR code can be uh, scanned through the loan application and you can do a payment so that uh, information will be passed to loan securely and uh, the payment will be done through a uh, loan. So it has, uh, the Vogue has a loan integration there. So for this particular use case, uh, you need uh, uh, to enable domestic payments from the co-banking system and also you have to enable the payment status for the Vogue uh, shopping cart because the payment is done through Loon and the status has to be passed to Vogue. So this is the second problem in uh, Toro Bank uh, right now. Uh, for the third one, uh, we are introducing our, our Toro Bank CRM, so like uh, we showcased the uh, internal core banking system. Now uh, we are introducing CRM. So here the CRM has its own backend and core banking also has uh, its own uh, database backend there. So there's no like a proper way to handle users. So all the users are users resides in both of these uh, databases. And also like if you see CRM admin and core banking admin look into the portal uh, separately. So there's no single sign on uh, enabled. So rather like uh, it's a must have feature, feature in these uh, nowadays like uh, in a normal uh, organization for internal communications. So with these uh, three uh, problems, let's see how we can resolve. So Toro Bank decides to go digital. So that's where like Chakra is come to into picture. So Chakra Bank Accelerator Program uh, actually resolves this. So, so it, it, it is a journey we actually do for a lot of banks and other financial institutes, plus also for uh, telcos. So we have some telco offerings as well. So Dave decides to choose Chakrai and Tom is the, the Chakrai consultant who will help uh, through the journey. So in the digital transformation journey, so these 10 points need to be addressed. So these are the like key aspects uh, we have to address in order to do a digital transformation in terms of those three pillars I uh, discussed earlier. So uh, there are like a lot of variations, sub uh, elements here, but uh, these are the general elements. So once you complete all of these 10 points, I think uh, you should be able to uh, successfully digitally transform uh, the journey. The first one is, uh, so we'll go one by one, the discovery phase. So now like uh, Dave, uh, the CIO actually works with uh, Chakrai consultant Tom. So the Dave always has an objective uh, digital strategy in mind and it, he has uh, different objectives. So what we do is uh, as Chakra, like we have, uh, we conduct multiple workshops, whiteboard sessions, uh, architecture sessions, and also proof of concepts uh, as needed. And we compare with our capability metrics uh, because based on the experience, we have set up capability matrix, matrices. And we compare that with uh, the capability metrics and come up with gaps, existing capabilities and future capabilities. So with this, uh, normally like we hand over traffic light report or maybe a health check report uh, 
to CIO so they can like evaluate where they stand in the organization and uh, where they uh, what are the improvements they need so that is the discovery and analysis uh, part then uh, we uh, so in the actual discovery uh, Tom uh, Chakrai consultants actually identified these uh, three uh, four aspects so for the first one is identity management the second one is API management third one is uh, integration and services and uh, we identified the fraud detection as well so that is not actually mentioned by Dave rather like we identified it because like when you have a payment use cases it's essential to have uh, the fraud detection uh, use cases as well so I'm not going to dig into all these uh, features here because like we have covered that uh, these capabilities in previous presentations so like uh, features like single sign-on custom user store manager integration LDAP integration so those are available in uh, identity management so integration scenarios uh, like uh, exposing, uh, connecting to SOAP backends, uh, connecting to ISO 8583 using ESB connectors, uh, and also transforming uh, SOAP uh, payloads to JSON, uh, REST JSON, and also like there's a requirement as to talk to the database uh, directly from the integration platform. So those are some of the integration related requirements. So in the API management, uh, as I mentioned you earlier, like uh, we had to expose uh, accounts, balances, transactions, and payments, right? And it has to actually adhere to the new Open API 3 specification. And obviously, like you need uh, once you do the API management, uh, it's uh, security is an essential part uh, there. And also, there's a requirement for passing the JWT token because uh, the old API is actually consumes based on the username. So we had to enable JWT and pass that user information to the backend. So the fraud detection is actually to identify patterns and alert uh, if something goes wrong in the platform. So this the this, this is the discovery and analysis process. Uh, so with this. Uh, so Tom actually identified four critical main uh, products which can be leveraged from the WSO platform. So that is WSO API Manager, WSO Identity Server, WSO Enterprise Integrator, and WSO Stream Preserve. So this is a L1 architecture of WSO. I think you can refer the WSO site or like uh, we had several sessions earlier which we actually covered these uh, product stacks. Okay, the second point is now you had done the analysis. Uh, now we, you need to establish the architecture. So this work and loan application has to talk to the gateway of API manager. So this is, uh, we, in the API manager, there are multiple uh, different deployment patterns. So we have actually used the partial, uh, uh, partial H H H H uh, deployment pattern here. So it has two gateways and two all-in-ones with uh, two analytics node. Now we have integration profiles here, identity servers, two identity servers, two stream processes, two analytics uh, nodes of EI, and also we have put RabbitMQ as the message broker for uh, Azure delivery. And uh, we have, uh, in order to like show different integrations, we have showed uh, elastic stack there. For that is for service monitoring. So at the top, uh, in the right hand side, you have the NFS mount, so that's where you actually mount all the configurations, uh, related things of WS2, which actually has uh, things to the DRTB. Uh, and you have like product level uh, databases there. And see other three boxes are actually for continuous integration. Uh, so we have added Jenkins as the continuous integration tool. Nexus as the artifact repo because like when you have a continuous integration tool, you have to make sure that you uh, keep all the release artifacts somewhere. So that's why we have added Nexus there. So Nagios is there for actually to uh, have the infrastructure monitoring. So this is the established architecture. So we identify what are the needed uh, uh, profiles, uh, WZ server profiles, and what are the needed uh, products we need uh, from other stacks. So this is the entire architecture we need. So the third one is the deployment model. Now we need to like convert that architecture model into the deployment model. So for this, uh, you need to do a, some sort of a capacity planning. So that is based on the TPS and also like latency. So those numbers needs to uh, be there in order to do a proper capacity planning. Uh, the next thing is uh, once you do a capacity planning, like uh, it also like uh, we have to evaluate uh, for at least for five years. So we have to make sure that our uh, infrastructure scale uh, uh, for five years at least, right? 
Then uh, we can identify how many numbers of nodes we need uh, for each and every server here. So this actually uh, covers the API management portion. So there are like other boxes available for EI and other stuff, but I haven't put that there. The reason is like this will be messy and you won't be able to see that. So this will be a lot of, uh, this will be a picture with a lot of boxes uh, where we have a deployment architecture model. So then uh, with this, uh, you need to actually uh, figure out the hosting solution. So sometimes like it could be on-premise or sometimes you can move this to the cloud or else you can actually follow a, a hybrid approach. So that is another thing. And the third thing is uh, you can actually, so this, this is monolithic deployment and uh, uh, next thing is you can actually have a microservices architecture as well. So like uh, for this uh, one, for API manager, you have the API micro gateway. For integrator, you have the uh, micro integrator available. So if you are going with microservices architecture, so the architecture needs to be slightly changed. Uh, I think uh, we discussed this in the previous presentation. So that is the deployment model. And this is the one update approach. Uh, so WSO2 has uh, a way to actually release patches and security patches, uh, uh, you, which is called WAM updates. So we have an inbuilt framework to actually promote these WAM updates to production servers. So reason is like normally uh, once you take uh, those patches from uh, WSO2, you can't actually deploy that to production directly. Rather like you store it somewhere, you test it and using a CI CD tool, you promote that to the relevant environments. So we have actually built that framework uh, in Chakrai and we have that uh, uh, inbuilt uh, in our like normal uh, Ansible scripts. So that is uh, another thing you need to consider when, when figuring out the deployment model. And the fourth thing is now you have done the analysis, you have the architecture, you have the deployment model. Now you can come up with the digital roadmap. So this consists of all the features, the roadmap you need to actually deliver the, successfully deliver the digital transformation of Toro Bank. So we have, uh, we are using tools like uh, Confluence and Jira, or like sometimes you might use uh, tools like version one, which is the industry standard. So here we have used a Kanban board and created all the uh, created full uh, digital roadmap here. So these first four uh, items uh, we call it as call that as a Chakra uh, uh, Accelerator Program. Uh, we call it as CAP. Uh, so we normally take uh, for a small to medium sized uh, organizations. Uh, it takes around one week to do this uh, uh, and create this roadmap. Uh, so we offer that. Uh, as an offering, uh, Chakra offering. Now, uh, with this, uh, we go to the agile delivery. So that's where we need to actually make, uh, uh, plan these features and actually try to execute it. So this digital roadmap uh, will be converted to a product backlog. Then uh, we will have to ha have that uh, as a sprint uh, backlog as well. So the reason is like these uh, key features, you have to like identify in terms of epics. So Epix is a combination of set of features uh, which actually drive, drive towards uh, one goal, right? So in that Epic, you might have multiple uh, different uh, stories and in that story, you have different uh, tasks uh, embedded. So uh, we identify Epics and uh, there are like multiple different, there can be multiple different Scrum teams uh, which consist of leads, teams and uh, team members and also Scrum specialists. So normally like uh, we uh, use the Agile Scrum methodology and uh, it can be two to four week sprints. So normally we stick to two week sprint because like uh, the changes we can uh, gradually migrate to the environment. So we, we, they see the progress regularly. So we prefer two week sprints. So with this, uh, once you complete, uh, so there will be a sprint review, uh, retro and show and tell and demonstrations happening each end of each sprint. So every day, uh, Scrum is also happening uh, as a stand-up. And uh, the KPIs, so KPI part, uh, we actually have few reports uh, created around this, uh, so we can actually have a burn down charts and a maturity model score that is for actually for CIOs. Uh, benefit. So maturity model score means like how far you are from the final goal. So it's it's a percentage. So like you can see uh, while you are progressing, you can see how far you are from the final goal. So that is agile delivery. So in the Tor Bank use case, uh, so we have actually come up with uh, five different epics here, right? 
So the first one is user management. Uh, the one in uh, green is account information. The one in blue is payment integration. The one in yellow is fraud detection. So those are the major epics we have identified. So under that you can uh, see a lot of uh, other stories uh, there. So that is the backlog. So you see another gray color one at the top bottom. So that is DevOps. So normally like uh, Chakra has an inbuilt DevOps framework which uh, does the infrastructure automation. So if you are going with cloud, uh, let's say if it is AWS, we use uh, tools like cloud formation. So if it is uh, normally a monolithic deployment, we use uh, Terraform. So likewise, uh, we have set of frameworks which can do the infrastructure automation. Then uh, it is essential to have the monitoring set up as well uh, in order to monitor the platform and services and the CSED aspect, product tuning and also the infrastructure creation. So those are the epics. So altogether like uh, we have the narrowed down into five epics based on the Toro Bank uh, journey we identified. Now, uh, how you place that in a delivery? So the initial requirement of CIO was to actually place them and deliver this within three months. So actually this is proven and we have done this uh, in many occasions. We deliver that uh, in two, three months. So that's that this is how we actually deliver. So even like once you complete one sprint, uh, the artifacts will be there in the production. Like if you wish to uh, put that into the production, yes, uh, it, it will be continuously rolled out into production one by one. So the sprint one is prerequisite. So sprint two is actually uh, is the uh, user management. Sprint three is accounts. Sprint four is uh, payments. Sprint five is the fraud detection. And I have put the cutover and hypercare there. Normally, like that, in that period, you hand over that to the support or the managed services team. So this is the basic structure of uh, the sprints. At the bottom, uh, the DevOps portion is there. Like it's also happening uh, parallelly there. So that is the agile delivery. So let's see like uh, how we can execute this. So I'll take uh, the sprint uh, four uh, as an example here. So sprint four, uh, the sprint four uh, epic was payment. So, uh, so what uh, the architect of the team, I mean, when we are actually doing that in the sprint, what he does is he actually do the high level design of the payment system here. So that work can loan actually uh, talk to the API manager. So it will uh, uh, consume the domestic payment and payment state API and also it has to facilitate authorization code grant type of identity server. And also like uh, JWT enablement and also the ISO 8583 connect architecture. So this is the high level uh, design. Then what uh, he has to do is uh, he has to convert this to the low level uh, design model. So this is where like uh, you talk about the low level designs. So it could be like this is based on the enterprise integration patterns or the microservices patterns you have in the organization, uh, in, in, the, in the industry, right? So you have to place them uh, in that. So if you look carefully like this talks about the EIP patterns and you can actually convert this into a working model using the developer studio. So that's how we normally uh, do this because this is the reference point and the developer can easily uh, convert this into the working model there. So this is the low level design. So it's then it's up to the developer to actually implement the service. So it's not only about the development. So this is the confluence. So whatever we do, we try to make sure that everything is documented in the confluence or so any knowledge base. The reason is like uh, sometimes like uh, after a few months, you tend to forget that. So even like when you want to onboard uh, new uh, users to uh, the organization, and this is a good reference point for them to actually refer and uh, get onboarded to the program successfully. So all the things will be documented here. If you see database lookups, third party services, data mappings. So everything will be there in one place. Uh, so you can use tools like Confluence for this. So that is the execution part. So number seven is testing, uh, testing and validation. So each story you have to facilitate that with uh, the testing aspect. So if you see here, there are like five different environments. So in a larger, in a larger organization, you might have five, six uh, different environments, but uh, smaller to medium scale uh, organizations, uh, sometimes you have like two, three environments. So the critical point here is you have to make sure all these tests, tests are carried out in any of the environments you have in the organization. So the first one is the code quality and uh, convention. So we use uh, tools like Sona Cube, unit testing. So you can use uh, JUnit, TestNG, rest assured. 
things like that. Then the behavior driven testing, so that is actually to test uh, the integration flows and also the APIs. And the perf test uh, normally happens before you migrate uh, things uh, to the production. So you can use tools like load UI or JMeter or the load runner uh, tools. Then uh, the acceptance testing part happens with Gage. It's uh, similar as PTT and uh, you can have acceptance uh, testing scripts written in Gage. For the production validation, you can use uh, the OWASP standards uh, there. So, like you have to make sure, like uh, when you do, uh, when you uh, talk about testing, you have to cover all of these aspects uh, in any of the environments you have. So that is the testing and validation part. So the number eight is the continuous integration and delivery. So we talk about uh, when you talk about artifacts, uh, you talk about open API files, that is APIs, integration services, data services in ESP also microservices, right? So you have to make sure that uh, the continuous uh, integration happens to all of these artifacts. So you have to have a proper branch in you know, or tagging strategy there. So it could be a JIT flow, JIT lab flow, any, uh, any, any JIT uh, related uh, standard uh, and you can utilize and have a proper branch in and tagging strategy. So when you promote, when you commit that to the code repository, you have to make sure that uh, with that bar branch in strategy, you run the CI server, so which can be Jenkins, and uh, then you have to like uh, release that to a proper artifact repository like Artifactory or Nexus. Then you run the code quality matrices. So that is the continuous integration part. So in the bottom, you have the continuous testing. So we talked about testing in the previous slide. So here you can actually automate it. Uh, so once you actually do this, uh, go, go through this flow, uh, you can automate th these uh, using these tools. Uh, so the, all, the, all the things will be uh, run in a pipeline of Jenkins. Uh, so so if, if uh, validation fails, it will trigger email and uh, actually alert the users. So the final one is the continuous delivery. It talks about rolling out these uh, changes to the production environments. So you need to have provisioning tools and also like we talk about uh, the rollouts and also like hot fixes uh, they are in the continuous delivery. So so number nine is non-functional requirements. So this is essential uh, to actually support the infrastructure and the services. So for the first thing is the platform monitoring. Uh, we had to talk about, uh, we had to like monitor CPU usage, memory and threats of WSO2 servers. And login and auditing, uh, so Chakra also has a framework around, framework around that. Uh, so it's a correlation ID base. So what you have, uh, what you can do is all all the API invocation to uh, integration layer. So uh, th those integrations are actually tra traced through a correlation ID. So in the log file, we see all the information using a correlation ID. But that login is actually a login uh, uh, login non sensitive uh, data only. So. With that, uh, you need to have a service monitoring tool. Like uh, it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't matter. Like uh, when you do a login and you, if you place that in a VM, uh, nobody is going to like look into that one. So that's where you need a service monitoring uh, mechanism where you t you have to publish these log files and log information to a service monitoring uh, dashboard, uh, something like a dashboard like Kibana or maybe like a dashboard in a stream processor in WSO2. And uh, synthetic monitoring uh, we use uh, as well. Uh, it is uh, based on the behavior patterns. We use uh, tools like Dynatrace, uh, synthetic monitoring uh, capabilities if you need to uh, get it. Or else you can use a stream processor again for this. Then the alert and notification also comes into picture uh, if you need to like alert uh, users uh, for SMS and uh, through SMS and email. Security is also essential. Uh, so you have to like uh, concentrate on platform, network, data, API, and uh, user security. So I think uh, most of them are actually covered through WSO2 products, IES, and API manager, especially like when it comes to data. Uh, so we uh, have to enable uh, the secure vault of WSO2. So these are some of the aspects, uh, non-functional requirements. So there are some other things as well, high availability and other stuff, but uh, it will be covered in uh, the uh, infrastructure setup. So this, uh, in terms of analytics, you can actually use the API, uh, these API product profiles, uh, API analytics, EA analytics, and IES analytics uh, there. So with this also, you can actually have uh, uh, understanding on the platform and, uh, and what is going on there. So number 10, uh, that's the last one. So when you have a proper non-functional requirements in place, uh, you can actually have a managed service offering. So that means support. 
So uh, the support team will actually uh, leverage uh, these uh, dashboards and um, they will actually look into those alerts and uh, they will actually proactively monitor the platforms. So they, that this is a support uh, offering uh, you provide, uh, that Chakra provides. So it could be 24-7, 8 by 5 or 9 by 5 uh, support mechanism. So uh, that is it. I think that is the 10 points we have uh, addressed. So let's see uh, what is the current state of uh, Toro Bank. So once you like carry out uh, those 10 uh, steps, so this is what happens. Uh, so the API manager is actually branded. Now Toro Bank has an API store customized uh, with their branding. So they have their logo, they have their color scheme uh, in the API store. And the second is, the second one is, and Dave and Tom are both happy. So they have actually linked uh, Toro Bank uh, to the Loon application there. So you can see that icon at the top. And you see the login page there. So that is the customized login page of Identity Server, which uh, uses the authorization code grant type. So when one you, once you log in, it will ask for the consent. Uh, the consent page is the third one. So they can actually approve and uh, reject uh, if they need. And uh, so when they link the bank, uh, they can see the uh, accounts here. So the account is listed here. So that is one of the Toro Bank accounts. Uh, so since we have added now, the balance is empty. And the transaction history is there for the Toro Bank. So the current state of work. Uh, so if, I, if you can remember, so work has this uh, loan integration and uh, it can uh, allow the payment. Now the loan, loan supports uh, payments as well. So with this digital transformation journey, I think uh, the Toro Band has achieved the goal and uh, they have actually in successfully integrated uh, their APIs with the Loon and Vogue. So this is the use cases of actually open banking, uh, open banking, AISP and PISP flows. So if you are uh, familiar with those uh, terms. Right, uh, so the final uh, slide is uh, Chakra Accelerator Program. So as I mentioned you earlier, the first four things we normally do that in uh, one uh, week, uh, week's time and come up with a digital roadmap. Uh, so if you need further assistance, uh, we can help you with this uh, Chakrai Accelerator Program.